you've been an academic for a long time now. How well do you even remember writing your thesis? Well, well, I don't know how to quantify that, how well, but I certainly remember it. And what one thing that I remember quite vividly is after uh, I derived the first rotation curves for uh, some of the galaxies that I was studying together with my thesis advisor, uh, David Rogstad, he passed away fairly recently, I believe, anyhow. Uh, when I found this, you know, flat rotation curve, in other words, that the galaxy was spinning very rapidly in its outer regions, indicating that there was more mass there than could be, you know, uh, explained by the number of stars in that area, that I, I felt that I had made a mistake somewhere in the analysis. I, I kept reviewing my uh, software, my coding, my my programming, to see if I had found or if I could find some sort of error in the uh, in the in the software that would account for the fact that these rotation curves went up that wasn't surprising but then didn't come down very very quickly if at all and uh, you know in retrospect of course this was telling us about missing mass dark matter so forth but at the time nobody was talking about that sort of thing so uh, that's what i remember i remember walking home from the or walking back to well my apartment uh, in Pasadena from the computing center and worrying about what was wrong with my software. Clearly, at some point, you obviously trusted the data and trusted your software because that's what you went with in your thesis. So what made you trust it? What made you, you know, what, what got you to that point of thinking, no, no, that's it. There's obviously mass out there. Yeah, well, I think it was the failure to find anything wrong. I mean, you know... <laughs> I'm I'm one of the first people to admit that making mistakes is something that I frequently do. But in this case, I simply could not find any way to explain these flat rotation curves other than to accept the fact that the galaxy was spinning too quickly. And as I say, in retrospect, of course, it all seems fairly obvious. But at the time, uh, anybody who published anything about determining rotation curves of spiral galaxies which is the kind of galaxy, of course, that NGC 2403 is, uh, they, they always assume that, okay, you know, the rotation sped up as you went out from the center, but very quickly it would decrease and it would become what's called Keplerian. In other words, you would get to some point in the galaxy where you were really outside beyond the limits of all the major mass in the galaxy. And then it would start, you know, the, the rotation would slow down. And nobody expected that it would stay stay rotating. But as I say, you know, you, you just try one thing after another and you look at your code and, you know, you dream about it and that kind of thing. And eventually I just concluded that, you know, it, it, it was rotating too quickly. And of course, writing your thesis, you don't lie. You just, you know, put down the facts. <laughs> Professor, if I could go back in time and ask the, the younger you who just found this discrepancy, what the heck do you think is going on? What kind of answer do you think you would have given me? Were you speculating? Were you talking to your supervisor? Did you have any wild theories? Or was it just like a complete mystery to you? I think it was pretty much a mystery. I mean, you, I, I knew that there had to be some mass out there to account for this uh, fast rotation. But, you know, you couldn't see it. I mean, it wasn't luminous. It wasn't stars, at least not luminous stars. I mean, it could have been, and as I said, I think at the time, it could have been footballs. You know, the, the the galaxy could have been filled with footballs, which don't make a whole lot of light. But if you have enough of them, they might, you know, provide enough mass to account for this this peculiar phenomenon. I didn't know what it was. And uh, I think that that's, that actually is still the case. We don't know what the dark matter really is. But uh, we do, you know, it's generally accepted that it's out there because this phenomenon wasn't just found in one or two galaxies. It's been found in every galaxy where we had data to determine the rotation. Is there any part of you that thinks there was like a missed opportunity for you to be Mr. Dark Matter, for you to have been the first person to kind of pin down this mysterious substance that's now so famous? Well, uh, yes, of course. I mean, you know, when you later, in, in later, I mean, it's, it's like many things that, uh, you know, were discovered in that era when you thought, gosh, you know, I could have written that paper, right? I had the data. But, you know, that that's all the benefit of hindsight. 
um, there's something called the Tully Fisher relationship, for example, which was used for a long time to determine the distances of galaxies. And, you know, we had the data to have determined that too. But sometimes, you know, other people interpret things in a more daring way than I did, or that anybody does really. And so I think that's very common in, in science that uh, they're, they're missed opportunities for sure. I, I, I have to say, uh, Ray, years ago, I attended a uh, talk given by an astronomer whom I knew quite well. Uh, he worked in Groningen in the Netherlands, uh, Tjert van Albada. He's still around, but, but uh, Tjert, you know, gave a talk in which he had looked into all this because he was interested. He was a theoretician. He was interested in this business of the rotation curves of galaxies, and he, you know, his his talk. Over and over again, he said, well, then Shostak found this and Shostak found that. And the guy who was sitting next to me, who was a buddy, you know, he turned to me because this was a surprise to both of us. He turned to me and he said, well, what does it feel like to be famous? And I said, well, I, I don't feel any different than I did 10 minutes ago, but which was true, of course. But, but uh, you know, it, it was being brought to my attention by this talk that there was really something of importance in this. I quickly want to ask you about your your dedication uh, to you, you dedicating your thesis to inhabitants of NGC twenty four oh three. Why did you do that? I I think I was just being a wise guy. I, I don't think there was anything very deep in any of that. I mean, I I looked at the dedications of other theses, and you know they they followed the pattern you would expect. I mean, people would don't you know dedicate it to their wives or girlfriends or whatever, or boyfriends. I mean, that was common. And I just decided to dedicate it to NGG 2403. That was the result of about one minute's worth of thought. Did it get any comment from your supervisor? No, 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 he didn't. I'm not even sure he read it, but he, he never said anything about it. No, my, my advisor, as they say, I had several, I had three advisors, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, there was n not just David Rockstad, whom I've already mentioned. He was a postdoc at Caltech, and uh, I worked most closely with him. He was a pretty clever guy, actually. He's unfortunately he's died recently, which is too bad. But in any case, but I also had other uh, advisors, including I think the most important of them was a guy by the name of Alan Moffat. He was also, uh, you know, working at Caltech at the time, and he was a pretty clever guy as well. And he had always some insightful stuff to say. My third advisor was a fellow by the name of Martin Schmidt. And he was not a radio astronomer. In fact, he was not really an observationalist much, although he did do observation. But Martin Schmidt was uh, most remembered for having discovered quasars. Uh, and, you know, because he, he also had found something that was very peculiar. He had found these objects in, in the sky that just looked on a you know, on a photograph like stars. So they were just points of light, but they were, they tended to be blue. But also if you, you know, made some estimate of how far away they were, there were techniques for doing that. These things had to be intrinsically extraordinarily bright. And they also produced radio waves. So they were called quasi stellar radio sources or, you know, things like that. And of course that became quasars. And he was on the cover of Time magazine when I was a student. That was a big deal. You know, we'd see him in the halls and this celebrity, Martin Schmidt. But he was a very nice guy. And uh, he, you know, he wasn't really the most influential of my advisors. That was Dave Rockstead. But Martin Schmidt would ask questions like, well, Seth, you know, have you thought about what you might find by doing this kind of work, trying to map the speed of rotation of galaxies in their outer regions using radio astronomy. And, you know, I hadn't thought terribly much about it. He said, well, why don't you write some software to sort of simulate, uh, you know, what, what might happen and see if you could, you know, figure out what's going on. And that was a good suggestion. I did do it as well. Uh, he, he was insightful. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, one would think that your dedication there was sort of foreshadowing what you later did at SETI, it showed you already had this uh, this extra interest. You mean in the inhabitants of NGC 2403? Yeah. Uh, well, well, of course, I was interested in SETI. Uh, right from the, I mean, I think that that's why I went into astronomy, because uh, not so much because I was interested in how stars work, the physics of 
stellar interiors or anything like that. But it was the idea of life in space. And of course, uh, that was simply a reflection of the sorts of things I was interested in as a kid, uh, the kind of books I read and, you know, which uh, planetarium shows I went to and so forth. I mean, there was a lot of science fiction in the movies. That's another interest of mine. I've made films for a long time. In fact, you can probably see a, <laughs> some equipment back there for that. But, um, you know, so I, I was interested in SETI. I mean, I was a kid. I was interested in the idea of life in space. But that's because of the movies I went to. Most of the time, those aliens, by the way, would come to Earth and mess things up here. Do you have a special bond with NGC uh, 2403 now? Is it, is it like, do, do you keep an eye on it? Would you love that to be, you know, a place where evidence of life was found? Well, I think it would be quite hard to find evidence of life in NGC 2403 unless you picked up a radio signal or maybe a laser, flash laser. It's far away. I mean, it's like three megaparsecs away. So uh, that's, you know, that's many millions of light years away. It's quite far. I mean, it's close compared to just about anything else in the deep sky. But, you know, uh, compared to the kind of distances we regularly talk about here in this part of the galaxy, it's, it's quite far. So it would be very difficult to find life there or uh, unless you could find, for example, as I say, a radio signal, flashing laser, some sort of signaling effort by anybody who happens to live in NGC 2403. But on the other hand, if you're looking for life, you know, most people don't look that far away. You can look for life in our own solar system, places you can reach with a rocket. So obviously that, that you know, offers opportunities you can't uh, consider when you consider NGC 2403. And by the way, there was one of three galaxies in my uh, thesis. Uh, the second one was also kind of a spiral galaxy, but it was seen on edge. And the third was an irregular galaxy, IC10, in the Southern Hemisphere, which is, you know, just a blob of hydrogen, really. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this, but I'm, I, I, don't, I can guess an answer. How likely do you think it is that there are inhabitants of NGC 2403, as you referred to? Yeah, well, I, I, would, bet, <laughs> I would bet my next month's paycheck, which, uh, given I'm semi-retired, is not terribly large. But, yeah, I, I'm sure there are. Look, the... The number of stars in NGC 2403 is, you know, it's on the order of maybe hundreds of billions. And yeah, most of those stars are kind of worthless for supporting life on a planet around them because they're too bright or they're too dim or something like that. But nonetheless, 10% of them are probably okay. So that's still a very large number of star systems. And, and unless you are convinced that the origin of life is some sort of miracle, some sort of highly unlikely event, then life will have arise, arisen, uh, you know, on, on many, many planets, you know, billions and billions, as Carl Sagan would occasionally say, in that galaxy. And, uh, you know, maybe most of that life is not terribly interesting. It's all single-celled life or insects or something like that. But, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that advanced life, you know, that has the capability to invent science and, and do science, things like that, uh, is restricted only to this planet. We have a lot of history that suggests every time you think you're very special, uh, you're usually wrong. So, I realize it was a bit of a glib sort of throwaway line at the end of your thesis, but you did offer to send a copy of your thesis to <laughs> NGC 2403. Has it ever occurred to you to do it, to send it, to transmit it? You don't need to send it by post, obviously. Has a, Have you ever thought, oh, could I point something somewhere in the right direction and figure out where it's going to be in X number of years and zap it up there? Well, that's an activity known as active SETI, where you broadcast instead of listening. I've always yep. been involved with listening projects. Uh, transmitting broadcasting sounds kind of interesting because you might provoke a response. But, you know, even if you assume there are, I don't know, just name a number, a million other societies in our own galaxy then the distance to the nearest other society, to the nearest other one, is still hundreds or even thousands of light years. So, you know, you send them a message, you somehow commandeer a very powerful transmitter, you aim it in the direction of, uh, you know, these guys that might be, say, a thousand, let's say a hundred, make it easy, a hundred light years away, you know, hi, we're the Earthlings, we'd love to get in touch with you guys. Uh, it'll take 100 years for that signal to get to them. And if they reply, that's another 100 years. So 200 years will have gone by and uh, will not be of great importance to you 
uh, what what they say. It'll be of importance to some people, I suppose. But you know, so that kind of an experiment, you know, it, it's 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 kind of discouraging when you look at what the implications are of trying to deliberately signal. And besides, I mean, even aside from all that, we've been signaling willy nilly for roughly a century into space, uh, mostly with our high frequency, high powered radio and television and radar transmissions. So we've already been signaling the aliens and if any are relatively nearby, you know, they'll be able to pick that stuff up and decide what to do with it. I guess I'm not talking about doing a, you know, in, in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, just to make good on your promise. Well, you mean to offer them copies of my thesis? Yeah. yeah don't, you know, you said, well, you said, you said you'd offered it to them. Make good on yeah, your promise. I, I, I did. Send it out there and say, there you go. I, I said I'd send it. You've got it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm waiting for them to reply. You know, <laughs> the, the, the sky's big. So you, you, you don't have the opportunity to transmit the thesis, uh, to uh, the entire sky. I mean, you can, but only at very, very, very low power. So if you want- Just, it, just it, to NGC 2403, where you said you'd send it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the fact that it's, you know, <laughs> hundreds of millions of light, what is it, billions of light years away? No, yeah. it's uh, three megaparsecs. So it's millions of light years away on the uh, order of 10 million light years away. You know, they're not in any great hurry, I would as, uh, assume. Maybe send it, it might be slightly self-indulgent, I guess. Well, also it's 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 difficult and expensive. I mean, there, there's the problem. Who who would pay for it? There, there's. I mean, we talked a little bit about active SETI, you know, where you actually broadcast something, and uh, people will ask, "Well, isn't that dangerous? You're just drawing attention to yourselves." Mm. I mean, that that's a question I get a lot. And then also, um, what would the aliens be like? That mostly comes from Southern California, where the movie industry is, because yeah. you know they're trying to portray aliens in a TV show or, or a film, and they want to know what science can say about what they look like, which, by the way, is precious little. But my personal uh, opinion is that most of the aliens out there that are clever enough to you know, either broadcast or receive signals are probably machines anyhow, probably machine intelligence, because you know, that's what we're doing. We're developing machine intelligence, AI. It's in the papers all the time. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not terribly threatening or even capable at this point, but a hundred years from now, that might be quite different. Is what makes the subject interesting in the first place. So this was this guy, Seth Shostak's thesis. Um, and a couple more things to say about it. So let me re I'll just, just read a bit from what, what he actually said about the the detection or how, he, how close he got to the detection of dark matter. So this is from the conclusions of his thesis. It says, the flat rotation curve of NGC 2403, seen in other late type spirals.